Hello, everybody. It's nice to see all of you tonight. Uh, we are going to wait um, for more people to tune in uh, since it is exactly 7.01. So I expect that more people will be tuning in soon. I hope everyone is doing well. For those of you who are watching this video after we record, um, I'll just go ahead and you know get started and update everybody on what's going on um, with med edits and um, you know with medical admissions in general. Um, please, everyone, post your questions to um, the comment section, and I will go ahead and I will answer those. Um, but of course, you know we know what kind of all the pressing questions everyone has right now, just because, um, you know, we're actively working with students who are applying to medical school, we're actively working um, with current medical students who are looking um, to match in, in residency next year, and they're gearing up for the residency match. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, I guess it's always an exciting time in medical admissions, just because the admission cycles um, are such that there's always something happening, <laughs> um, which is, you know, part of why I love what I do so much. Um, so just to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Dr. Jessica Friedman. I am an emergency physician and I am the founder and chair of Med Edits Medical Admissions. And we help students um, get into BSMD programs. Um, we help students get into um, accelerated programs, early assurance programs. Um, obviously we help students also get into medical school, um, both MD and osteopathic. Um, and we um, assist students as they apply for residency, as they apply for a fellowship. And um, one of the best things that we do is we get to work with students throughout the continuum of their medical educations. So we work with them when they are current college students. And you know, then we will work with them um, when they are medical students. And then even once they are residents looking for fellowship. So you know, we have been working with students um, you know, over many, many years. And, and we just love to see our students' careers blossom, um, to find out what's going on in their personal lives, um, and to see everyone grow and mature. So anyway, so please post your questions. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to, you know, kind of, you know, answer some questions that I assume all of you have, uh, just based on the questions that we are getting right now. Um, so as far as students who are still on wait lists, um, you know, yes, it is July, but we are still seeing some wait list movement. Um, not a ton, obviously, because it's so late in the season. Um, but, you know, just yesterday, in fact, we heard about a student who got into an outstanding allopathic medical school who actually had been working with us um, you know, on a reapplication and was just accepted to medical school. So that certainly happens every year that some students that we are working with on reapplications get accepted. Um, and that's always such a happy thing when that happens because, you know, it just sort of catches everyone a little bit off guard. Um, and the student had a 509 MCAT. So it is possible. You don't need a 520 on the MCAT to get into medical school. Um, so we are also, you know, our current uh, medical school applicants, those who have submitted and who are verified are working on secondary essays. Um, so that's in full swing. And then our residency applicants um, who are getting ready to apply for residency in September, um, they are starting their uh, fourth year rotation, some of their away rotations um, and some of the rotations in specialties to which they will be applying, um, not yet working on applications. It's still a tad bit early for residency applicants to be working, um, but not that early. So, um, so that sort of is where everyone is right now in, in the cycle. So let's, um, let's just kind of, you know, jump right into questions. And again, I encourage everyone, you know, to type your questions, because that's really what I'm here for. I can answer questions about 
you know, just about anything related to um, the medical admissions process, as well as, you know, any questions regarding um, undergraduate college, um, you know, what you should be doing to position yourself well to be a competitive applicant for medical school. Um, and also for high school students who are maybe considering um, BSMD programs or, or who are, you know, considering what would be the best undergraduate college to go to um, in order to position yourself well for medical school. So, um, you know, I can address all of those questions. So is it considered easier to get into medical schools in your home state? Is this the case only for public in-state medical schools or also private medical schools in your home state? So generally speaking, it is easier to get into your home state medical schools. Um, and that is because many state medical schools um, accept the majority of their applicants from the, from their own state. So, um, but it's important to look at the data. Um, and what you can do is you can go to the MSAR, the Medical School Admissions Requirements, which is updated every spring. The data really does not change that much, however, from year to year. And you can look at, for all of your state medical schools, the percentage of in-state matriculants. So what percentage of students are actually attending that medical school from your state. And you will find, depending on the state you're from, and if you want to let me know what state that is, I can sort of chime in on whether that's a really good state for medical school admissions or not such a good state, because there are variations in that as well. Um, you know, but for example, there are some state medical schools where they're going to be taking 100% of their students from in-state, and there are other state medical schools that are taking um, you know, 50 to 60 percent of their students from in-state, and those are the public schools. Now, as far as the private school goes, the private schools go, it depends really on the state and on the medical school. So your most prestigious, most elite medical schools are not taking a majority of their students from in-state, but some of the less prestigious schools will show some in-state preference. So again, it's really important to look at that data, to look at the percentages of matriculants from in-state and out-of-state, and that's gonna give you a sense of your competitiveness. And you should also look at the average MCATs and GPAs for both in-state and out-of-state applicants, because that can vary too, um, especially for, um, for state medical schools. Um, okay. So what is the timeline for medical school? When should things be started, submitted for medical school? Okay, this is um, a great question and one we get a lot of. So um, I, in the ideal world, um, you want to be submitting your medical school application as soon as the medical school application systems open. And for allopathic or MD granting medical schools, that is going to be the end of May annually, all right? so. Again, that is in the ideal world, okay? If let's say you are submitting your application now or you're submitting your application within the next week, it is not a deal breaker, okay? As long as everything else is done. So your MCAT is, you know, is done. You've already taken your MCAT. Your letters of recommendation are already requested and are being, you know, transmitted, um, you know, to AMCAS, which is um, the allopathic medical school application system. Um, and you also have the benefit of now being able to start to work on this year's secondary essays based on this year's prompts. Because at this point, medical schools are all starting to release their 2022 medical school secondary essay prompts. So as soon as you submit your application, you can get to work on those prompts, right? So you can turn those essays around very, very quickly. This is more difficult for students, frankly, who um, are submitting their applications really early um, because you know they're basically starting on those essays, a lot of them, as they're getting the prompts. Okay. Um, thus far, we're not seeing a lot of change in prompts from last year to this year. So we're not seeing a lot of surprises there. Um, also was told by my college that the state you attend college in will have a better chance. Is that true? Is this for public and private medical schools? There is some truth to that. And, um, and this is why when we work with students, um, we want to know, um, well, from your college, you know, kind of what are what are the feeder schools? You know, where where are kids? You know, where are the students? 
go, where are a large percentage of those students going to medical school? So for example, let's say you go to school, you go to college in Virginia, right? A large percentage of students from your undergraduate college might also be attending medical schools in Virginia and not because they're in the state. So there definitely can be preference for students who attend college in a certain state to also, you know, be considered seriously for medical schools within that state. And again, this is this is college specific data. So we always like our students to try to get that information directly from their pre-med advisors. This is also why even if you're working with us, even if you're working with a private advisor, you still want to nurture that relationship with your pre-med advisor because they have some information and some data that you know no one else has really. So, um, so there definitely are colleges that traditionally have very good relationships with medical schools. So medical schools that sort of historically have always taken a very large percentage um, of their applicants. So that's, that's a great question. Um, I'm planning to apply for regular MD programs next week. Will it be considered too late for medical school? So I think Priya, I already went over this, but I'll say it again, it's not too late. Um, get to work on those secondaries right away. So if you are if you are submitting next week, I mean, that's you know mid-July, you should be verified by mid-August, assuming your MCAT's in, assuming that your secondary essays are, you know, basically turned around, you know, within 24 hours because you'll have um, the opportunity to work on those, you know, after you've submitted, um, you know, that's not going to be too late. We really consider a late applicant, um, you know, someone who's getting everything completed, you know, around the end of August, around Labor Day. That's when we start getting a little bit nervous. Um, okay, is um, in Mount Sinai's flex med, what does it, um, what does it more to flex into something? Does it have to be related to medicine? Okay, so for Mount, the Mount Sinai flex med program, which is an early assurance program that students will apply to their soft, during their sophomore years of college. Um, this is a, an incredible opportunity and Mount Sinai is taking up to 50% of their medical school classes now from the FlexMed program. Um, the FlexMed program is an extremely, extremely competitive program. So the students with whom we work who get into FlexMed are students who really have exceptional accomplishments um, they tend to go to really exceptional undergraduate institutions. They have incredible high school records as well. Um, and they, they tend to be, they tend to excel, have already excelled in something, you know, whether that is athletics, um, whether that is some other type of national accomplishment in, in athletics or in music in some other discipline. So essentially, um, you know, Mount Sinai, when you're applying to FlexMed, they want to know that, um, you are going to be using that extra time that you have, that gift of time. They want to know that you're going to be using that time um, efficiently and effectively and to do something and to make some real contributions, right? So that you're sort of not just applying to this program so you can get up taking the MCAT and, you know, that you can sort of have a fun time in college because, you know, you have this assured spot in Mount Sinai. They really want to know that you have a plan in place. That plan does not necessarily have to be related to medicine, right? It, again, you know, let's, let's say you are a division one athlete, you know, maybe you're going to be, you know, spending a lot of time on your athletics. Um, you might have, re you know, you might be very interested in research in medicine medicine, or maybe it's unrelated to medicine. Maybe it's not basic science research or medical research. Maybe it's research in anthropology or linguistics or art history, right? They just want to know that you're going to be making some sort of valuable contributions, um, you know, on a scholarly level with that extra time that you have. And they are, they're looking for students who definitely kind of already have pre-established niches as sophomores in college. And, you know, frankly, many students just don't have that, even if they're outstanding students, you know, with outstanding academic records. Um, can you talk about fellowship after residency in France? Mm, oh, I see, okay. I can't really talk about that actually, believe it or not. Um, 
Uh, we, if, if you are doing a, if you are doing residency in France, I think this is what you mean. If you're doing your residency training in France, it's going to be difficult to get a fellowship in the United States. I don't want to say impossible, um, but it's going to be about relationship building if you want that to be a possibility. So it's going to be about, you know, if you're doing your residency in France, you want to be building relationships with people here in the U.S., doing research with people here in the U.S. who then maybe would give you a spot in a fellowship here. Um, this is not something that we see happen very frequently. Um, most students who are, most applicants who are doing fellowships here in the U.S. have also done their residency training here in the U.S. as well. Um, how is Texas for medical school? Texas for medical school is fantastic. And that's because there are so many medical schools in Texas. Now, Texas is also a huge state. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, a lot of medical school applicants in Texas, but there's also a huge range of medical schools in Texas. So if you are a REACH student, um, you know, someone who is applying, uh, you know, to very competitive uh, medical schools, you know, there are options for you in Texas. And if you aren't a REACH student, if you're someone who, you know, is, is less competitive, there are also options for you in Texas too. So um, we actually, um, you know, see Texas as being a great state to be for from um, if you are applying to medical school. And, uh, you know, there are only um, two medical schools, I believe, the Osteopathic Medical School in Texas and um, TCU that don't participate in TMDSAS. TMDSAS is the Texas Medical School Application Service, and Baylor now participates in TMDSAS. This is the first year they've participated in it. Last year, they, you know, they were part of AMCAS, and that's what they have been a part of um, historically. So it's going to be interesting to see if Baylor's um, data changes in terms of are they going to get fewer um, out-of-state applicants and fewer out-of-state matriculants. Um, because, you know, obviously if you are applying to medical schools in Texas, you're completing TMDSAS, but most students, um, I, I would think um, from out of state who are applying to Baylor um, are not going to choose to sort of just do an entire application system just to apply to Baylor. So that's gonna be interesting to see what happens this year. Um, New Jersey is also a very good state to be from for medical school. Uh, lots of options in New Jersey, um, you know, UMDNJ, um, you know, so Robert Wood Johnson, Newark, I guess it's Rutgers, Newark, Rutgers, you know, Robert Wood Johnson, um, Hackensack is also a terrific new medical school. Um, we've actually had um, a, several students in the past years who have gotten into Hackensack from out of state as, as well as from in-state. Um, and then Cooper as well. So, um, you know, New Jersey is um, an, an osteopathic school as well. And so, so New Jersey is also a really, you know, wonderful state we think to be from for, um, you know, for medical school admissions, definitely. Um, excluding geography, does it really matter where you go to medical school if you are only interested in clinical practice and not research, teaching, et cetera? Um, it does matter, um, and this is potentially going to matter more once the USMLE Step 2 goes past fail. So USMLE Step 2 um, used to be a quantitative test, um, you know, where you would get a three-digit score, but now it's going to be going past fail. Residency programs became extremely reliant on that test in terms of screening out applicants in the same way that um, medical schools screen applicants out based on the MCAT. Um, now, residency programs are no longer going to have that metric to screen students out. Um, and the reason it was switched to a qualitative test, so a pass-fail test, is because it was always supposed to be that when it was originally developed. And, you know, it really, nobody ever wanted it to be a quantitative test. So, um, your medical school's reputation is going to become a little bit more important, we anticipate, um, you know, once that test goes past fail. It also depends on the specialty that you are applying for. So if you, for example, end up wanting to do, um, you know, orthopedic surgery, ophthalmology, dermatology, otolaryngology, those um, specialties are much more competitive, let's say, than like pediatrics, family medicine, internal medicine, and there also are fewer programs. Um, so essentially all of those programs, even if they're based in community hospitals, 
are going to be academic to a degree. Um, so it does matter where you go to medical school, but I will also tell you that any medical school in the United States is an outstanding medical school. It's simply just so unbelievably competitive to get into medical school now that if you can get into a US medical school, as long as you do all the right things, you can match into the residency you wanna match into and you can match into the specialty you wanna match into. Now, when it comes to residency, like let's say you decide you wanna become a plastic surgeon and you go to a medical school that you know, isn't, you know, the most prestigious medical school, you may end up doing residency somewhere where maybe you didn't really want to do it, you're probably not going to end up, you know, in one of the, you know, kind of more popular cities, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, but you know, you might have to go somewhere that maybe you wouldn't be thrilled about going to for residency training. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, so you're an incoming M1. Good luck to everyone applying. Thank you, Raghav. That's so nice. And um, yeah, and good luck to you, Raghav. Um, you know, your M1 year, let's just kind of comment on that. A lot of students will start their M1 years, their first year of medical school, thinking like, oh my gosh, I, I need to start my teaching and my volunteering and I need to do research. And they, they're sort of still part of this pre-med mentality where they think they need to do everything, okay? Your first year of medical school, you want to get accustomed to your medical school. You want to get accustomed to the workload, the studying. You want to make some friends um, and you want to feel comfortable, right? So you first want to get acclimated to your environment, then start thinking about what you want to get involved with, okay? The, um, the thing about applying for residency um, is that residency programs really want to see that you're focused, right? So if you are applying for, um, you know, let's say anesthesiology, they want to see that you've been in the anesthesiology interest group. They want to see that you've done anesthesiology research, um, you know, so it, it becomes a much more focused um, sort of application process. And that's generally kind of how it goes. It even becomes even more focused for fellowship. So does that mean that you shouldn't be volunteering in your student run free clinic? No, that always looks good, right? Things like that are always valuable. Having a very broad foundation of understanding what medical practices working with different populations. This is important no matter what specialty you're going into, but we sort of encourage students to kind of get out of that pre-med um, kind of mindset of where they just think they have to get involved in a in hundred things and go in a hundred different directions, um, you know, and, and instead you want to try to spend that energy also exploring specialties. The vast majority of students will start their M1 years not knowing what specialty they want to pursue. Um, and so shadowing, believe it or not, is still important as an M1. And that's because you, you want to gain exposure to different specialties in medicine. You know, as an M3, as a third year medical student, you're only doing your core rotations. Most medical schools do not have the opportunity for you to actually do formal rotations through, um, you know, subspecialties and, you know, things outside sort of the core specialties that you'll be doing as a third year. So shadowing doesn't end and gaining exposure to different specialties in medicine in different settings um, that needs to continue until you've really kind of figured out what you want to do with your with your life so to speak <laughs> um, and uh, anyway med medicine is also a wonderful career because no matter what you do there are, you can branch in different directions um, so there are always options and opportunities in medicine um, what are the average minimum scores you need to have to be um, considered a competitive applicant for BSMD? What about BSDO? I know it varies. What are the minimum you need? Um, generally speaking for BSMD, we like to see over 1500 on the SAT. Um, we would go lower, maybe a four, 1450 for, um, for DO. And then the equivalent concordant, um, you can look at those concordance tables, um, you know, if you're taking the ACT. Um, and then as far as GPA, you know, we want to see high GPAs for both, right? So I, I definitely find that there's just generally speaking grade inflation across the board at, at most many high schools in the country. Um, so you want to have as high a GPA as you can, let's just put it that way. Um, and you want to be taking the most rigorous classes um, that that you possibly can as part of your curriculum, right? So if, you're, if your high school offers APs, um, you want to be enrolled in those AP classes, especially in your science and math disciplines. Um, and you want to try to be taking um, all five core subjects for all four years. So I hope that helps. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, how hard is it to go into anesthesiology from DO versus MD? 
So there is NRMP, so the National Residency Matching Program offers all of this data. And so it's, um, it's important to look at that data to see um, how many students from osteopathic versus allopathic um, medical schools are matching into anesthesiology. I don't know that those numbers off the top of my head. Um, I would think that um, it's going to be easier to get into anesthesiology as an MD than a DO. But again, it is completely possible. Um, and I've worked, you know, with osteopathic, um, you know, anesthesiologists. So, you know, those programs that are traditionally osteopathic. So the residency programs that traditionally take osteopathic medical students, um, you know, are obviously going to be open to osteopathic medical students. And then you need to look at the MD programs that will consider both MD and DO, um, you know, medical students. Um, okay. Is geography in context of which state we graduate from or the state from where our primary home is located? So it's the, your, your state residency is determined by the state you live in. So, so wherever your legal address is, but if you've gone to college in a certain state, which shows a certain allegiance to that state, um, that is also going to, going to carry some different amount of weight. So for example, we had somebody who um, ended up um, at a, an outstanding medical school in North Carolina, was not from North Carolina, but, you know, but went to college there and, and was from another state that was, you know, a, a pretty, you know, on the opposite side of the country from North Carolina. But because um, they had gone to medical school in North Carolina, you know, the, the medical school saw that allegiance and um, that student was accepted and as, as a very low percentage um, of out of state applicants. So um, certainly if you're from, if you go to school in a certain state, you know, you, you might be given preference, preference for, um, you know, for those in-state schools. Okay, good questions tonight. Um, are you considered disadvantaged if you have had um, a chronic physical disability? The disadvantage section of AMCAS, they have a very specific description of what disadvantage means to them. Um, so um, based on my understanding that would, you would not qualify as disadvantage, but I, we would have to know the specifics about what that disability was um, and, you know, and how you would write about that um, on your application if you would write about it on your application. Um, for the Mount Sinai Flex Med program requires an SCT ACT score. What about the people who apply during the pandemic Without any scores, this, I was literally just talking about this, um, you know, yesterday, <laughs> because now that everyone um, is applying, and now that all the colleges have gone test optional, um, I was, I was just saying, I, I don't know how this is going to now be impacting, um, you know, programs like FlexMed and, you know, even medical school admissions. So certainly something that we always want to know from our students is, well, how did you do on your SAT or ACT? Because that gives us a sense of how they are likely to perform on their MCAT, right? And so now without having that metric from students, either <clears throat> because they chose to be test optional, they didn't really try as hard as maybe they would have if that wasn't a possibility, or because they just didn't take the test, we now don't have that metric to be able to kind of be able to predict, well, are you gonna, are you likely to do well in the MCAT? Or are you not likely to do well in the MCAT? So as far as FlexMed goes, we're gonna have to see um, what FlexMed uh, decides um, in terms of how they are going to uh, to navigate, you know, that, that little wrinkle. I, I can almost guarantee they haven't really thought about it yet. Um, they probably won't be thinking about that until, <clears throat> let's see, you would, you would, if you're a freshman, um, they probably won't be thinking about that till 2022, 2023 at, at the earliest or 2022. Um, I would predict, however, um, just knowing how these programs work, they're not going to feel comfortable admitting students who don't have a stellar standardized test score just because when you're applying to a program like FlexMed, it is essentially allowing you to bypass the MCAT. So they don't want your first standardized test to be when you take the USMLE step one, right? That's super risky. So I would think that if you are going to be applying to places like FlexMed without an SAT, ACT, and without any standardized test scores, I'm thinking you're gonna have to just be at a tip top college um, with 
a perfect GPA to even be considered. And basically they will have to be very confident in your academic abilities based on, you know, everything that you have. Um, so that, that's my prediction. We'll see if that comes true. Um, are intramural sports important during your pre-med years? Is there any advantage to partaking in them? You should do intramural sports if it's going to make you happy and if it's going to make you a more balanced person <laughs> um, and if it's a healthy way for you to get exercise, to meet people, to socialize, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of improving your candidacy for medical school, it's not going to really improve your candidacy for medical school. Um, you know, everyone likes to know you're doing something outside of the classroom and that you're, you know, you're a normal fun person, um, but it, that can be intramural sports or it can be, uh, you know, other hobbies. So I, I see that mostly as being a hobby. Um, okay. How important is clinical shadowing if both of your parents are physicians? So if you've shadowed your parents, that's fair. You know, sometimes people want to shy away from the fact my parents are doctors. It's going to look bad if I've shadowed them. It's like, well, no, you have access to opportunities. So if, you know, hopefully your parents are in two different specialties in different settings. So if you've shadowed your parents, that's giving you exposure to medicine. So that's terrific. Shadowing is not as, um, you know, popular or, you know, not seen as, you know, as sort of as much of a must as it used to be. So it used to be that, you know, medical schools wanted, you know, students to have hours and hours of shadowing. And, and now medical schools want to know you have exposure to clinical medicine, but they want you to be more hands-on. So they, the sort of the more passive activities, the hands-off activities are not looked upon as favorably as they used to be. So, you know, we discourage students from collecting hundreds and hundreds of shadowing hours. Um, it's important to you know, spend your time doing something where you're, you know, you're really going to make an impact. Um, yeah, Raghav says, it feels like a honeymoon. I know there's work ahead for me over the next year because he's starting medical school in August. There's a lot of work ahead, Raghav, but medical school is, is super interesting and um, you're going to meet so many great people and you're going to have a great time, really. I, I think I think I think medical school is a fantastic experience. It was for me. And honestly, it was, I don't dare I say, but it was actually easier than college. That's my personal experience. Depends on where you went to college and what your experience was. Um, okay. Um, is it advisable to submit a secondary application for medical school before having all required letters of recommendation? Absolutely. You know, um, most medical schools are not going to review your application until all those letters are in but um, there certainly is no harm in submitting um, a secondary essay if you're done. Uh, Reapplicant, could you please advise if I should contact a few schools I applied to and find out what can be improved? Absolutely, this is something that we recommend for everybody. So if you have um, applied to medical schools in the past, the only, most likely the only way they're going to give you any feedback is if you interviewed there. Um, if you um, if you didn't have an interview, it's unlikely they're going to give you feedback, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. So if there are some schools that are definitely high on your list, schools that you sort of anticipated based on, you know, kind of your experiences, your stats, your state residency that you would have expected to get an interview, I, it's perfectly fair to call and say, look, I'm a reapplicant. I'm just wanting to know what you can, you know, what I might do to improve my application. This is something we always encourage our students to do to try to get that feedback. Um, not only can you sometimes get some really valuable feedback that's really, you know, something you can work on, but it also just shows tremendous maturity. Um, um, and, you know, kind of um, no bad feelings and, and it's just an overall, uh, just a great thing to do. Okay. Um, is, is EMT good for medical school? Yes. EMT is great for medical school. This is hands-on clinical experience. It's something we definitely encourage our students to do. So, so that is it for tonight. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Um, please, you know, join me again next week. Email questions if you have them, info at mededits.com. If anything that I said tonight needs any clarification, you can also send an email. Um, and please sign up for a free 15-minute consultation with us um, if you're interested in learning more about how we might be able to help you and to talk about your situation. Um, and we um, will go ahead and post that link in the chat. And, um, and good luck to everybody, wherever you are in the process.